Welcome to Gateway Sermons, and thank you for joining us as we venture together through God's Word. You turn your Bibles to the 19th chapter of Luke's Gospel. I was thinking as we look at this passage, it, one of my favorite type of movie is, or genre, is westerns. I love westerns. I love just kind of the, I love, uh, what? I know it's a little more modern, but I like old ones too, but Tombstone's probably my favorite Western. I love the movie Open Range, if you've seen it with uh, Robert Duvall and Kevin Costner. But, but Westerns have this very unique way, and I don't, I, mean, I don't think they intend to do this. They, just, they kind of echo something so often that Jesus did if you really think about it, how many times in a Western have you seen that the premise is you have a town or a group of people that are just oppressed and their lives are in danger and, you know, they're being ruled over or, or, or uh, you know, oppressed under some horrible villain, usually, you know, wealthy and, and has, you know, a huge group of guys with them and gunfighters and all that kind of thing. And then in the middle of the movie, a hero, a stranger rides into town, and the old ones, you could always tell who was who by the colors they wore, black and white and all that kind of thing, but, and he has the skill and the ability and the temperament necessary to save the town, to deliver the people from oppression, and then usually he just leaves, right? A great picture of that, one of the best Western pictures of that. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Pale Rider, with Clint Eastwood, just vintage Clint Eastwood, and he rides into town, and then and they even, you know, when he rides into town, it's so great because the young lady in, the, in one of the cabins is reading from Revelation about the pale horse, and the, the one who sat on him was death, and right in that moment, Clint Eastwood's horse shows up in the town, and then from there, you know, he just kind of takes over, you know, gets rid of the villains, and then he leaves. He, and so much of that is, is precisely, if we're looking for metaphors, for pictures, precisely what Jesus has done. Except when Jesus left, Jesus would be back. It's not an open-ended story. And this morning in Luke 19, I know we looked at it a little bit two weeks ago on Easter. But now let's, let's begin in verse 28 and, and focus on the fact that Jesus announced his kingship over Israel by arriving on a donkey's colt to remove the oppression of the people by Jerusalem's wayward leadership. So let's begin at verse 28, and look at that part of this passage again quickly. And when he had said these things, this parable of this, this horrible nobleman, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, which is just about just under two miles from Jerusalem at this point, at the mount that is called Olivet. So the road from Jericho, where Jesus was, goes through Bethany. It's on the far side of I guess the kind of the ridge of the Mount of Olives. It overlooks Jerusalem from the east. And, and as you would be, if that's where you were, from, from there the city, Jerusalem comes into sight just across the Kidron Valley. He sent two of the disciples saying, Go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you untying it, you shall say this, The Lord has need of it. Now, I don't know, but it, it almost seems like, um, because, because I, I think each of the Gospels that mention this are careful to mention that little detail, and I wonder if, if, if what's happening is Jesus didn't have a, maybe a prearranged agreement with somebody in that town, um, and the words, the Lord has need of it, were almost like the, the code word to let whatever, or whoever that was, know that the time had come for him to arrive. This is when he was going to need the donkey. That may be the case, because it's just, it's just strange that, that those details are there. Verse 32, so those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, the owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road, as you would do for a king. Jesus, what's very interesting here. All through the four Gospels in the narrative of the life of Jesus, Jesus walked everywhere. You never find Jesus riding, at least not in the text, anything until this moment, where he's probably by now about a mile away from the city. So, you know, it's not just happenstance that he's like, you know, for this last mile, I'm going to go ahead and 
I'm not going to walk anymore. Jesus fully intended to be seen in this moment as fulfilling the Old Testament, the Old Covenant prophecy from Zechariah, that Israel's king one day would come on a colt, on the foal of a donkey to be specific. Jesus isn't hiding anything here. He's being very blatant and very clear. This is even reminiscent of 1 Kings chapter 1. I don't know if you remember this from verses 32 to 37 where Solomon, in order to show that he is the rightful king, comes in on David's donkey. So Jesus is being very deliberate here as he prepares to enter Jerusalem to say to anybody that's watching and listening, I am that king. This is me. As he was drawing near, verse 37, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And I know we often hear that, you know, the same crowd that was praising Jesus one week was yelling, crucify him one week later. That's not, according to the text, that's not exactly accurate. This is not the Jerusalem crowd. These are mainly his disciples and some others that had been, um, been with him or around him. The crowd here is not the people of Jerusalem. In fact, in the text we find Jesus doesn't actually arrive in the city technically until verse 45. And the reaction of Jerusalem as a whole when Jesus gets into town as a whole from the start was very antagonistic. They, they were immediately against him, at least from the leadership. And so this crowd loves him. This crowd is all about Jesus, at least in this very moment. They see Zechariah 9.9. 9. They, they know that text. They see it being fulfilled as they consider all that this Jesus has been doing. And now he's on a donkey's colt so that you know, their, their, their affection for him, their worship of him is, is, is very specific and deliberate and clear. They're crying out from Psalm 118 because they think this is the king. Verse 26, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is their king. And then what do they say? Peace in heaven and glory in the highest, or Hosanna in the highest, that this crowd echoes and affirms, if you remember, what the angels were saying and proclaiming about the birth of Jesus in the beginning of Luke's gospel. So we've gone full circle, verse 39, and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. All kinds of rebuking in 18 and 19 going on around Jesus. The Pharisees, for the most part, for the almost whole part, never learned that we know of. And there's a reason probably the Bible is silent on their futures. These men are the precursors of what Jesus is going to experience now in full force in Jerusalem. This is the last time that the Pharisees are mentioned like this, that, that they're called the Pharisees. Once Jesus actually enters the city, he'll be confronted by those authorities, the main authorities, the highest of them. The religious authorities, that is, in Jerusalem. Verse 40, he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And which would be a powerful sign of judgment against Jerusalem for her rejection of her king if the stones were to cry out. Jesus Christ is God's son. Jesus Christ is God in human flesh. Jesus Christ is David's son. This is the heir. He is the only rightful and eternal heir of David's throne. When God promised in the Old Testament to keep a man on it forever who would rule in righteousness and peace, this is him. This is the one. And that's so obvious, Jesus is saying, that the rocks know it. The rocks don't debate it. They're not uncertain. They're not unclear. So Luke is, is not only telling us Jesus zeroing in on the unbelief and the uncertainty of the Pharisees, but also of his audience, right, of Theophilus and, and that group. Again, I don't want to paint them in a negative light. They just We know from the opening of the gospel that they had uncertainty about whether or not Jesus is the king. And it's so obvious in everything that Jesus said and everything that he did, if you just consider Luke, by the time you get to Luke 19, the, the, the rocks know, like everything knows, drywall knows. That Jesus is the king. Babies certainly know it in Luke. But this is a statement here really about, unfortunately, about the insanity and the tragedy of Israel's, uh, of Israel's rejection of what is so divinely obvious and clear. 
And while Jesus is about to unleash by far the most powerful demonstration of just precisely how divinely furious he is with this religious leadership in Israel, just before that happens, interestingly enough, in Luke's Gospel, we find that anger over unbelief is also characterized by a broken heart. Verse 41, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, as he's looking at the city, even you, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, even you had known on this day the things that make for peace. If you would have known, God coming to them as a king with salvation, that is what makes for peace. It's what made for Jerusalem's peace. That's all that makes for peace, but they don't want it and they will not have it. But now they are hidden from your eyes. It's not playing anymore. Now they're hidden from you. Their rejection of Jesus kept them from seeing how he could heal them. The rejection of Jesus Christ deepens human blindness. Verse 43, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. It was right in front of them, all along, the way to peace, the way to life, and they missed it on purpose. They chose to reject it. They did not, Jesus is saying, you didn't realize that the one who could bring peace finally, everlasting peace and wholeness was right in front of you. And you didn't want him. Israel should have responded to Jesus like whoever the owner of the donkey's colt was. Oh, the Lord, the Lord is speaking. All right, you know, you have need of it, okay. Israel just kept rejecting the Lord. They always had, they always had. Jesus' words of what is going to happen to them sound a lot like, unfortunately, a lot like the prophetic descriptions of when Nebuchadnezzar would capture Jerusalem in 586 B.C. when the city was just utterly destroyed. And then you get the book of Lamentations where Jeremiah is just sitting watching his city, the beloved city of God, just burn. It sounds like some of that. Jesus had already predicted the destruction of the temple if you remember back in 1335, and he'll get much more adamant about that in chapter 21. But here, he actually predicts the Roman siege of the city as a whole in A.D. 70 and all the devastation that is going to follow that. These men, that's why he says that, this, you will see this. This will happen with you. There was gold inlaid between the bricks in the temple. The Roman soldiers would pry them apart. Literally, not one stone left upon another to get to those things. They would be destroyed. Very real life consequences were the result of spiritually, in their own hearts, rejecting what would make for peace, what would help them avoid this, to embrace the one thing that could protect them from all this. Jesus was their escape from that. He was their protection from death and oppression, but they didn't want him, and they left themselves open. And them, them leaving themselves open to it is, is absolutely devastating because they did it so pridefully. And I am not insulting Israel or the Jews as though if, if I would have been there, I, no, 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 I would have been right along with them. That, I think that's the whole point. But this is, the, the, the Jerusalem would say when Pilate was like, like you, Pilate was a dog, but Pilate tried. You know, I mean, he, he tried to avoid it on, on some level. You know, you crucify him. We're, we're not going to, no, no, no. What do they say? His blood be on us and on our children. And it has been in Israel since they crucified Jesus. It has been. We have no king but Caesar. There it is. No, we, we have a king. 
Thank you very much. We have the great and mighty Caesar. Now forget that every Caesar in the line of Caesars that reigned when Rome occupied Israel was horrible to them and brutal to them. And that was the reason they had that court, that kangaroo court anyway, is because they didn't have the sovereignty of a nation, which they should have if they wanted, but, but they didn't have that, so they had to go through the Romans in order to carry out their own law. Forget the fact that that was happening while they said this, that they were an oppressed people, a, a, a ruled over people. No, no, no. We, Caesar promised us. Caesar, can, Caesar has an army, you see. Caesar has an army. Caesar, you know, we can, we, our king is Caesar. We don't want anything to do with you, king of the Jews. And, and he's one, he, he was one of them. Caesar couldn't bring peace. The king they wanted couldn't deliver them. Their true king came to them to save them. They had other ideas for what they wanted out of a ruler. Jesus wasn't serious enough for them about political power. He wasn't serious enough for them about the law. He wasn't serious enough for them about their expectations and desires. So when Jesus came, they looked peace in the face and said, we don't, we don't want that. We want peace, but not that kind of peace. We'll find our own. And when the peace that comes from God through Christ alone is tossed aside and rejected for a peace that we think we can get for ourselves through our own ways and means, all we're doing is perpetuating our brokenness and our suffering and our lack of wholeness and peace like Israel suffered. And so, the divinely furious. I heard Joel stinking Osteen say one time that Jesus had a temper. Jesus had a bad temper, so he lost his temper here. Jesus Christ did not have a short fuse. And he didn't lack control over his emotions. Because he loved, when he saw something, that would hurt people, he got angry. That's different than just blowing a fuse for crying out loud. This is divine fury. It's righteous indignation that we're about to see. And the Savior King, brokenhearted and furious, has had enough. Now since chapter 9, verse 51, Jesus has been, or uh, Luke has been telling us that Jesus is going to Jerusalem. He has to get there. He set his face to go there. But then when he gets to the city, Luke doesn't say, and he entered Jerusalem. Luke says, because the temple motif is so big in the Gospel of Luke, Luke says, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Now, if you remember, if you know your Old Testament at all, if you remember in Ezekiel chapter 10, the glory of the Lord departed from the temple. It was, it was taken away. Ezekiel saw it happen. Nothing could have been more devastating to a devout Jewish person than the glory of the Lord leaving the house of the Lord. And that's what happened in Ezekiel. But Luke's gospel, how does Luke's gospel open with these hints and these whispers that something is going on in the temple? Zechariah praying there. God was up to something, something. Things were stirring in the temple again. And then just shortly after that, along comes this baby in the temple that is, that is blessed and prophesied over. And then skip up, a, 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 you know, what, 12 more years, and, and there's this child saying that I must be in my father's house. In Luke's telling us of the temptation of Jesus, Luke puts the temptation where, where Matthew has it second in the order. Luke puts it third because he wants the temple to be so big to us in Luke, the center where the glory of God was to reside in Luke, that's Satan's temptation to him that if you throw yourself down from here, Luke puts that last because he wants Jesus on the temple. And then in Luke 19, finally, legitimately now, very clearly, after all that time, the glory of the Lord. Who is Jesus? The glory of the Lord is not Israel. 
The glory of the Lord, the radiance of his glory, the personified version of the glory of God is Jesus Christ alone. And the glory of the Lord re-enters the temple finally, and the first thing that he does is clean house. It's disturbing and beautiful at the same time. So there were traders in sacrificial animals and supplies that had set up shop in the outer courtyard of the temple, which is, by the way, the only place the Gentiles were, non-Jewish folks were allowed to go. And of course, of course, you could only buy the spotless animals that you needed, the ones without blemish that you needed if you wanted to make a sacrifice to God because it's Passover time, so the city's starting to swell over now, and the businessmen know that. And they know that, that if you want to get in there and make your offering, you can't do that without a spotless sacrifice. So these guys, they get the right animals. They buy everyone else out. So you can't buy your animal from anybody else. And then they jack up the prices. And so now poor people have to scrape everything they have together just to buy the right amount of turtle doves and, or a spotless lamb or whatever for their sacrifice. And the religious institution in Israel knew about this, encouraged this. Jesus watches that. And in John's Telling of this, I, I think this moment in John chapter 2, he puts it at the beginning. Jesus stood and watched it, and the text says he made a whip of cords. So he didn't just like walk in there and blow up. He, he saw it happening. Heard like the prophet and judge Samuel did, this bleeding of sheep. Right? He's, he hears all the, the commerce and the the, the, you know, the haggling and all this stuff and these poor people being taken advantage of and Gentiles who couldn't get in any way being taken advantage of and he just starts to nod and seethe and make a whip of cords and then he goes off. And again, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. This is not like he snapped. No, no, no. God is angry. Sometimes, anger is not automatically sinful. If it's from men, it's sinful. But this, again, sometimes the only godly response to something is anger. Sometimes that's Christ-like, to be mad for the right reasons. The whole Jewish religion has been infected from the inside by the love of money. And Jesus quotes two Old Testament texts before he starts flipping these tables over and shoving these men out of there. Quotes Isaiah 56, 7, which revealed that the temple was meant ultimately in fulfillment to reflect God's desire that all nations would come and worship him. See, the story was, Israel was never the end of the story. It was a picture of what the end of the story would be. It was, it was meant to be a house of prayer for all nations. Then Jesus quotes Jeremiah 7, 11, and his great temple sermon, which also denounced Israel's sinful behavior, even while they still claimed God's presence among them. But this moment also alludes to uh, the prophecy of Malachi in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, when the Lord would arrive one day in person to purify the temple. And the day when commerce would be eliminated from the house of the Lord later on in Zechariah 14, the same prophet that, that prophesied of his coming in Jerusalem on the code of a donkey, 1421. All of this is coming to fulfillment in, in these things. In the anger and fury of God's Son as He arrives. The radiance of the glory of God in the temple. Jesus had come to undo the oppression of self-serving, money-loving, self-righteous leaders in Israel. And in doing so, pronounced that He had come to do it for the world. Verse 47, And He was preaching daily in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. All the higher-ups, all the leadership, all the wealthy guys, they wanted to destroy him. But they did not find anything they could do for all the people were hanging on his words. So the crowd in the temple courts is going to grow and shift over those next few days because of Passover. And by this time, it's going to be largely made up of people that, that just by percentage are going to have a much more favorable opinion of Jesus, the more people you get from the outlying places where he did so much ministry and they're hanging on his words. That's such a positive image in Luke. First it was Mary at his feet, Martha busy, 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 
Mary has chosen the good portion. Martha, be like this. Sit here and hang on my words. And now here, in contrast to the leadership who are not hanging on his words, they want to hang him. And they're going to do much worse to him in just a few more days. They're going to arrest him and crucify him. Jesus Christ, in Luke 19, is throwing down the gauntlet on the Jerusalem authorities and their whole institution. The law was not bad. The law is holy and righteous and good. They had perverted God's system. And as the King of Israel and the Savior of sinners, this is going to get him killed. That, that, that's going to get him killed. If there was one thing immediately speaking, that he did, that, that it, was, it was his attitude towards the Sabbath, what he did on the Sabbath. That was probably the main one. So that only human beings would have the audacity to accuse God of blasphemy. What Simeon predicted in chapter 2, verses 34 and 35 of Luke is now taking place. He will be opposed to the point of death. Many are going to rise because of Jesus, but also, as we're going to read almost literally here in the next chapter, next week, God willing, Many will fall underneath him and be crushed by him as he takes his throne. Jerusalem is indecisive at best in Luke's gospel. That's a kind way to describe their attitude towards Jesus. Yes, it's the city of God, but it's also the very symbol on earth highlighted for us in microcosm of the human insanity of rejecting God's Messiah, rejecting Jesus as the king of the world. Again, this is the city. Jerusalem is the city that stones the prophets and kills those who are sent to it. It's Jerusalem that will reject and crucify Jesus. But what Jesus encounters here, or the reason for which Jesus is rejected here, is constant in human history, and it is universal. Don't, again, do not look down on Jerusalem. They are us, we are them. The rejection of Jesus knows no prejudice. It's a global problem. Every individual in the world has it. And Luke is certainly putting this before Theophilus and the audience to whom he writes, saying, how will you respond to him? Because they're doubting, they're struggling, they're uncertain. Which again, there's, just, there's no place or time in the history of mankind, of humankind, where it's going to be welcomed or easy to have Jesus be your only king. The four Gospels themselves reveal that Jesus was rejected to the point of crucifixion, of death, amongst the people, the only people in the world that had a Bible. They're the ones that killed him. That believed there was one God and that he had spoken. That's what they believed and they murdered his word incarnate. And as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, the great city where David once reigned over Israel in its glory days with David and, and the beginning of Solomon's reign, a small crowd does hail him as king, but the city will reject him. And under the sound of their rejoicing, that's why Jesus is sobbing. He's weeping here. Because what should have been so clear and so obvious that even the rocks know better has been outrightly rejected by the one people on earth who had everything they needed to be ready for it. They're the ones that had the law clearly given to them. They should have known by the time you get to Jesus in history, we are hopeless to follow this thing. Come and save us, please. Have mercy on us, please. We can't adhere to this. But they think they can because they, they, they mess with it and shift it so they can keep the things they call big and kind of leave, you know, well, that's, we're, we're going to kind of leave that out and they didn't get the essence of the purpose of the law, and so they reject him. They don't think they need him. And the message to us this morning is clear. Beloved, do not assume this morning. Do not assume that any of us are above rejecting what makes for peace. Don't assume that any of us are above rejecting our only king. Israel is evidence to the world here that we do not know. We, we cannot see. We cannot identify the things that actually will make for peace. We don't buy it. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We don't buy it. 
we believe it, we would say, of course, he's the Prince of Peace. The Bible tells me so. But like we, we don't, that doesn't become something that affects whether or not I actually have peace in my life so often. We're so corrupted at our core that we always reject the one thing that would give us peace because we're convinced ourselves that we've convinced ourselves that we not only know what will bring us peace, we know how to get that peace, which is why, beloved, Jesus Christ in the gospel for you and me always seems a little bit irrelevant when we're suffering. It's just a platitude when we're suffering. Yeah, Jesus is Lord. Yeah, Jesus is my peace. Yeah, it's finished. Yeah, I know that, but and I'm not denying the realness of anything we're experiencing when we begin to feel that way. That's not my point. Not, not dogging on you or me for struggling and for it being real. I'm saying it's just that how we generally tend to respond to Christ for us. It's just like, yeah, I mean, I know that, but Jesus is the only maker of true peace. That, that's true, always, always. And all that our rejection of that, our, our disagreement with that, our, our problem with that, all that's ever done all that's resulted from it really is, is war, famine, upheaval, conflict, strain, sorrow, pain, globally, individually, in our own lives and in our own families even, in our own schools, our jobs, our relationships. We, we just will not stop pushing for our own way, for what we believe will bring peace in all those things. We, we will not stop pushing and clamoring for what amounts to nothing more than at best a fragile peace and a temporary one. We can't stop trying to shape everyone in our lives into something that won't be so troublesome for us to deal with. Just like, I'm going to squeeze you into what I like so that I can stand you. And then I'll have peace. And what has that done to our marriages, to our relationships with our kids, to our, to our work relationships? We're, 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 because we won't take peace, we don't have any to give. We, 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 we're not peacemakers if, if we are denying the sufficiency of Jesus. And the answer is not, hey, go be a peacemaker. That's a law that's meant to crush you because you can't be one and send you running to Jesus. And in spite of the fact that we just find ourselves again and again and again in the agony of having broken another relationship or ruined another job or messed up another golden opportunity, we just keep believing the problem is, is outside of us and if all these people and all these things would just line up and do what we want, then we'd have peace. And the Prince of Peace is standing over our lives, arms wide open, willing and ready to receive, furious at what is killing us. No, no, I, I, I have, yeah, you too, so that when I die, I don't go to hell. But now, I need something a little more solid. Everything else is sand. All of it. The best thing in your life that isn't Jesus is sinking sand. Only Christ is the rock. Only Christ. Peace on earth is the result of Jesus bringing it with him from heaven. Peace is foreign to this world. The only, the only way to peace in the world is for you to kill all your enemies. And then you start fighting with each other and divide again and then there'll be another war. Jesus came to reform us, to make us new inside of this Titanic to make us whole by living to perform the obedience for us before God that we needed to be accepted by him and by dying to forgive our sins by rising from the dead to give all of that to us this is the path to peace reconciliation with God is all that will make us whole vertically and horizontally that's why Paul is telling believers in 2 Corinthians 5, be reconciled to God. 
He tells that to a church, a, a messy church. We're, we're not, look, we have issues and struggles, but we are not Corinth. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. The king who comes on a donkey but flips over tables and whips people when they cover God up with nonsense, that's the key to peace. Don't resist the reformation that Jesus has come to do. Beloved, we need saved. We need healed. And then we need sustained because we're going to continue. Our flesh is going to wage war against our soul and we're going to continue to believe that other things make for peace when only Jesus makes for peace. To resist that king is not just, and most importantly, to leave ourselves under the wrath of a holy and righteous God. But that wrath is, according to Romans 1, is already among us to a very large degree in the very sins and things that we can't get ourselves out of. The wrath of God is actively hurting humanity by God's design right now. To resist his salvation, because he's not just like this long, white-bearded, temperamental judge. It's him that has initiated and designed salvation from himself, from his wrath. He's holy. He will not accept or stand or put up with our sin, but he is also filled with love and mercy and will redeem those who come to him by grace through faith. Don't resist that mercy. To do so is to stay under his wrath, stay under that futility that it causes, and so to submit ourselves to nothing but more of what we keep finding at every stage in our lives cannot heal us. It's Jesus or it's more of that and then we die. The true king judges those things that won't make for peace. Because it's only in him that we will ever know it. Not just between each other, but between us and God. Beloved, Jesus Christ has come as a king and a savior to bring peace to all who are oppressed. Jesus is what makes for peace. Amen? Amen. Thanks again for joining us. And if you have any questions about today's recording, Gateway Church, or what it means to follow Jesus Christ, you can reach us through the contact section of our website, gwbrawley.org.